So by now you may have heard of the Trudon 2.0. This printer is generating a lot of interest because of its similarity to the Voron 2.4. Where it differs from the Voron is in the ease of assembly, taking just a few hours to get up and running, as compared to multiple days for the Voron. But none of that matters if the print quality isn't up to snuff. In the last video in the series, I provided my first impressions on this printer and showed a side-by-side -side comparison of the print quality as compared to that of my Voron 2.4. My conclusion was that the overall quality was good, very comparable to the Voron, and in some ways superior. However, the balance started to shift in favor of the Voron as soon as the print speeds were increased. Even at fairly low speeds, the Trudon suffers from very bad ringing. And if you're not familiar, ringing is the term for the print artifact that manifests as a repeated pattern on the surface of the print. This is a result of the elasticity in the motion system, originating primarily in the belts, but also in other areas of the frame. This elasticity induces vibrations where there's a sudden change in the direction of motion. Fortunately, there is a way to compensate for these vibrations. And this is using a technique called input shaping. Using input shaping, we can alter the acceleration profile of the motion in such a way that the vibrations from one move are dampened by the vibrations of the next. Think back to high school physics and the superposition of waves. If the crest from one wave aligns with the trough of another, the net result will be a lower amplitude of oscillation. In order to configure input shaping, we need to know at what frequency of motion the amplitude of vibration is maximized. This is called the resonant frequency. So how can we analyze the frequency response of a 3D printer? Well, we can use an accelerometer. This is a printed circuit board with an accelerometer chip and some header pins for reading the data. Specifically, this is the LIS-3DH accelerometer. If you've experience with Clipper firmware, you may be more familiar with the ADXL-345. Unfortunately, this accelerometer is not compatible with RepRap firmware which is what is under the hood of this Trudon 2.0. I ordered this accelerometer from Amazon. Before you can use it, you will need to solder the header pins onto the PCB. For this process, I used a small battery operated soldering iron. When you're doing this, it's important to ensure that you don't inadvertently bridge the solder between two pins. As a sanity check, I recommend using a multimeter and conducting a continuity check. The next step is to wire up the accelerometer and connect it to the printer. When connecting an accelerometer to a printer running Clipper, we do so via the GPIO headers on the Raspberry Pi. In this case, we don't have a separate microcontroller, so we have to wire the accelerometer directly to the motherboard. To make the connection, we require a five volt source, a ground connection, two programmable logic pins, and a serial interface. Fortunately, we can find everything we need on the EXP headers for the LCD screen. To access these, we could remove the bottom panel of the printer unplug the LCD ribbon cables and plug into the motherboard directly. A much quicker and easier method is to plug in upstream at the ribbon cable with the LCD removed. So once we remove the LCD, we can plug in all of the connections for the accelerometer directly into those ribbon cables. So we need to use the wiring diagram from the manufacturer to guide us in making those connections. And we need to be careful because the columns of the ribbon cable are opposite on the board side as compared to the LCD side. If you're mindful of the position of the tab, that will keep you oriented. And if you've wired it correctly, a light should come on the accelerometer when the printer is powered up. Since we've removed the LCD and replaced it with an accelerometer, we need to make a few modifications to our board.txt file. We also need to add a line to our config file to tell the firmware which logic pins the accelerometer is connected to. Next, we'll install the input shaping plugin, which can be downloaded from the link in the description. Then we'll start both the accelerometer and input shaping plugins. If everything is configured correctly, you should be able to run the input shaping calibration process and see some data being generated. Now that we've completed the wiring and firmware configuration, we need to mount the accelerometer to the printhead. After taking two measurements and spending a few minutes in Fusion 360, we have a mount ready to print. With the accelerometer mounted and connected to the printer, we can start collecting data. For the wiring, I used some DuPont jumper wires. These were quick and convenient, but in hindsight, not the best choice of wiring. 
These connections are prone to pulling apart, so you need to be careful to manage the wires while the printer is moving. I was able to run a few tests using this setup before the accelerometer lost connection to the motherboard, but not because of a disconnected wire. It lost connection because of electromagnetic interference. So as it turns out, the chip select signal, which is the green wire, is susceptible to this electromagnetic interference, otherwise known as EMI, which can break the connection between the accelerometer and the motherboard. The EMI is exacerbated over long distances of parallel wires, which we have plenty of here. So the quick fix is to isolate the CS wire from the rest of the wires, either with some shielding or just by physically holding it further away. Hey, Editing Taylor here. If you're enjoying the video and you want to help support the channel, please consider joining me over on Patreon. Not only will you be supporting the production of these videos, but you'll also gain exclusive access to a high quality catalog of 3D models, and we'll be creating new models for you guys every month. We'll place a special emphasis on models that sell. So if you want to generate revenue from your 3D printer, or maybe even turn your hobby into a full-time job, you'll definitely want to check it out. All right, back to the video. The better solution would have been to use a USB 3 cable from the beginning, cut the ends off of it, crimp on the appropriate connectors and make the connections that way. Because the USB 3 cable has inherent shielding within it. So you won't need to worry about that EMI. After a few attempts, I was able to collect enough data to determine the dominant frequency of resonance. And this is where the difference between clipper and RepRap becomes very apparent. In clipper, the input shaping process is almost completely automated. The input shaping script is executed, causing the printhead to vibrate, first in X and then in Y. Afterwards, a frequency response graph is generated for each axis, with the dominant resonant frequency being identified and the optimal shaping function recommended. In RepRap, the process is much more manual, and we can only apply a single shaper globally, rather than one for each axis. As well, rather than having the resonant frequency identified for us, we have to visually inspect the graph and choose what we think is the highest peak. We then also have to choose which input shaping function we think is going to best diminish the vibrations, and there's no recommendation made on our behalf. So we do need to use our judgment. If we've chosen correctly with that input shaper applied, we should see a much flatter frequency response. So this is all great in theory, but in practice, for me at least, no combination of shaping function or frequency yielded any discernible difference in the amount of ringing I was observing in my prints. So this led me to revert to a more manual approach. I printed ringing test tower after ringing test tower, alternating the frequency and the shaping function between tests, but I still had no success. I then decided to print a test tower that incremented the frequency of the shaper at five millimeter increments. And I ran this test for each of the six shaping functions that are available to us in RepRap firmware. When I still saw no improvement, I knew something else had to be wrong. This led me to comb through the config file and compare the settings for the Trudon to those for the Voron. Now these printers are running different firmware. This runs RepRap, the Voron runs Clipper. The values aren't directly comparable. For instance, RepRap uses absolute voltages for their stepper drivers, whereas Clipper uses RMS values. In addition, Clipper uses square corner velocity and RepRap uses jerk both different ways to describe the rate of change of acceleration. As it turns out, the stock setting for jerk in the Trudon firmware is considerably too high. So with the jerk reduced from the stock 2000 millimeters per minute to a much more conservative 600 millimeters per minute, I reran the frequency test tower using the ZV DDD shaper with a frequency starting at 45 Hertz and increasing by one Hertz every five millimeters. And much to my delight, at a frequency of 46 Hertz, the ringing was finally all but gone. So it took me a lot longer to get this result than I had initially anticipated, but the ringing issue has been solved. Through the process, I've realized that the accelerometer approach is, frankly, overrated. I found it easier just to print the ringing test tower and skip all of the wiring and firmware changes. For most printers, the 45 to 55 Hertz frequency band of the test should be a wide enough window to capture the resonant frequency. If it's not, you could always print a taller tower. So with this approach, you would need to print at most six different test prints because there's six different shaping functions available to us. And if we can expect those results and find the best combination of frequency and shaping function, then we have our answer.
no accelerometer required. This approach is really only viable because in RepRap's implementation of input shaping, we only have a single global shaper. If we were to try to apply the same approach in Clipper, we would need to print at least twice as many tests since we need to determine those variables for the X and the Y axes. What's even better about this method is that it's free. Besides the minimal amount of filament required to do these test prints, you don't need to invest in an accelerometer, any wiring, and you're gonna save a whole lot of time. I ran my tests at a pretty conservative 2000 millimeters per second squared acceleration, which is the firmware default. When configuring input shaping in Clipper, we usually determine the maximum acceleration at the same time. This limit is determined by the amount of smoothing or the rounding of sharp features that we observe in our test prints. The smoothing is a byproduct of the fact that we have distinct shaping functions and frequencies for each axis. Therefore, whenever we do a diagonal movement, which has components in both axes, we need to average the results of the shaping. And the averaging is what results in the smoothing of those otherwise sharp features. In RepRap, since we're applying a single shaper globally, we don't observe the same smoothing phenomena. And therefore, the maximum acceleration is not limited in the same way by the application of input shaping. So in theory, we could use input shaping at higher acceleration values and not suffer from the same smoothing in RepRap firmware as we would in Clipper. However, you could also argue the counterpoint that the input shaping is less effective at lower accelerations because we're using one global variable, which is not necessarily the correct variable for either axis. So there's definitely pros and cons both ways. So in conclusion, if you're planning on picking up a Trudon 2.0, I would highly advise you to reduce the stock jerk setting and then print a few ringing test towers and use those to configure input shaping. Don't bother with the accelerometer unless you really wanna visualize and analyze the raw data. So thank you all for watching. This was part four of my Trudon series. Please subscribe down below for future video updates. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D. Catch you in the next one. Happy printing.